Good evening. Our text this evening comes from Ezra chapter 9. Ezra, ninth chapter. <clears throat> After all these things had been done, the officials approached me and said, The people of Israel and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the peoples of the lands with their abominations, from the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Ammonites, the Moabites, the Egyptians, and the Amorites. For they have taken some of their daughters to be wives for themselves and for their sons, so that the holy race has mixed itself with the peoples of the lands. And in this faithlessness, the hand of the officials and chief men has been foremost. As soon as I heard this, I tore my garment and my cloak and pulled hair from my head and beard and sat appalled. Then all who trembled at the words of the God of Israel because of the faithlessness of the returned exiles gathered around me while I sat appalled until the evening sacrifice. And at the evening sacrifice, I rose from my fasting with my garment and my cloak torn and fell upon my knees and spread out my hands to the Lord my God, saying, O oh my God, I am ashamed and blush to lift my face to you, my God. For our iniquities have risen higher than our heads, and our guilt has mounted up to the heavens. From the days of our fathers to this day, we have been in great guilt. And for our iniquities, we, our kings and our priests, have been given into the hand of the kings of the lands, to the sword, to captivity, to plundering, and to utter shame as it is today. But now, for a brief moment, favor has been shown by the Lord our God to leave us a remnant and to give us a secure hold within this holy place that our God may brighten our eyes and grant us a little reviving in our slavery. For we are slaves. Yet our God has not forsaken us in our slavery, but has extended to us his steadfast love before the kings of Persia to grant us some reviving, to set up the house of our God, to repair its ruins, and to give us protection in Judea and Jerusalem. And now, O oh our God, what shall we say after this? For we have forsaken your commandments, which you commanded by your servants, the prophets, saying, The land that you are entering to take possession of it is a land impure with the impurity of the peoples of the lands with their abominations that have filled it from end to end with their uncleanness. Therefore, do not give your daughters to their sons, neither take their daughters for your sons, and never seek their peace or prosperity that you may be strong and eat the good of the land and leave it for an inheritance to your children forever. And after all that has come upon us for our evil deeds and for our great guilt, Seeing that you, our God, have punished us less than our iniquities deserved, and have given us such a remnant as this, shall we break your commandments again and intermarry with the peoples who practice these abominations? Would you not be angry with us until you consumed us, so that there should be no remnant nor any to escape? O oh Lord, the God of Israel, you are just." For we are left a remnant that is escaped as it is today. Behold, we are before you in our guilt, for none can stand before you because of this. Let us pray. Righteous Heavenly Father, we thank you for preserving this prayer of your servant Ezra the scribe. We pray, Father, that you help us to understand your will Help us, Father, to learn a right attitude towards our sins as we consider Ezra's attitude towards their sins. And, Father, help us to always be penitent. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. So last week we considered Daniel and his prayer at the, the tail end of the exile. The Lord had destroyed Israel. In fact, by the time that... Uh, in fact, by the time that Jeremiah was prophesying, 
what Daniel had read, Israel had already been destroyed a hundred years prior. And so by the time that Daniel is reading that prophecy, it's more like 150 uh, to 200 years after Israel was destroyed. Judah, he sent out of the land into Babylon. And why did God destroy Israel? And why did God send Judah out of the land and into captivity? Well, among other things, the prophets bring up several things, but among other things, the Lord did this on account of their idolatry, which came about as a result of their intermarrying with the nations and adopting their customs, including their religion. This is one of the things that Moses warns them about in the law in Deuteronomy chapter 7 uh, that Ezra quotes from in his prayer. There is a warning not to intermarry with the nations because of what will happen, uh, that they'll be led astray. And over the course of Israel's history, we see that's what happens. It happens during the period of the judges when we learn that Israel has failed to drive out all of the nations. It happens in the period of the kings. Uh, the most infamous case being King Solomon, who for all of his wisdom was not wise enough uh, to keep himself from marrying half a bajillion women <laughs> and uh, not being particularly discriminating in where he took his wives from. And we see him setting up high places all over the land for his wives to worship at, uh, which... We can't really say begins Israel down the path to idolatry, but it certainly begins the royal fascination with idols that we see from the kings of Judah and even the kings of Israel, um, even though they're not part of David's lineage. Uh, the, the kings of Israel take what Solomon started and ramp it up to the next degree. So Israel has been in captivity, Daniel reads this prophecy in Jeremiah that they will be in captivity for 70 years. This is not a forever thing. That God is going to send them back into the land. And so Daniel prays in Daniel 9. Uh, as we saw last week, it's a prayer of repentance. It's a meditation on God's mercy. That, that God, by promising Judah that he would return them to the land, God is being merciful with them. He is not holding their sins against them forever, but is rather admonishing them and then showing mercy on them by allowing them to return. And so Daniel prays uh, in both of those uh, modes, repenting of Israel's sins and meditating on God's mercy. Our reading tonight... Ezra 9, and our reading next week, Lord willing, Nehemiah 9, they take place during the early days of the return from exile. Remember that Ezra and Nehemiah are the major figures um, in charge of things whenever Israel, whenever Judah first returns to the land. When you look at Ezra 9, what do we find has happened? We get this introduction before the prayer. The officials approach Ezra and say, The people of Israel and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the peoples of the lands with their abominations, from the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Ammonites, the Moabites, the Egyptians, and the Amorites. For they have taken some of their daughters to be wives for themselves and for their sons, so that the holy race has mixed itself with the peoples of the lands. And in this faithlessness, the hand of the officials and chief men has been foremost. They are once again embroiled in sin. They are once again embroiled in exactly the same kind of sin that got them sent into exile in the first place. Seventy years they have been gone, nearly twice the duration of the wilderness wandering, enough so that people who were just born at the beginning 
of the exile would be having grandchildren at the time of the return. Seventy years is enough. Well, you, you think about it. You've got 70 years in exile. That's a lot of time to mull over your exile, isn't it? And yet, Judah still hasn't changed. Ezra's prayer tonight confesses Israel or Judah's specific sin before God. Just as Daniel confessed their general sinfulness. Like we said last week, it's essential that we confess our specific sins. Ezra is naming the sin here because it's a specific sin he's praying about. It's essential that we confess our specific sins and repent of them as we become aware of them. And again, we'll quote once again, 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What we learn from Ezra in his prayer is that this is something that we must do no matter how often we sin. No matter how often we commit the same sin. Because what Ezra is confessing, what Judah is repenting of in this chapter, is something that they've been repeating over and over and over for centuries. Again, you go back to Judges, and that's, that's the constant refrain throughout the book of Judges. Yeah, once again, Israel, yeah, the, the Lord's anger was kindled against Israel. Israel went after other gods. You read that time and again in Judges. That's at the beginning of their time in the land. And that is the constant story of Israel as they're in the land. They are always going after other gods. And here they are. Hundreds of years later, having just come off of this 70-year-long punishment for having worshipped other gods, and they're right back at it. And here Ezra is, praying about it, confessing it, repenting of it. And here's the thing. Whenever you give in to the same temptation over and over again, there's another temptation, a new temptation that rises to join the first one, to take advantage of the first one, and that is the temptation to just give up on repenting. And that is a fatal sin. No matter how many times we have to do it, no matter how many times we have to confess the same sin and ask God's forgiveness of it, and commit to turn away from it, it is essential that we keep confessing our sins and keep repenting of them. We must continue repenting because we must never be satisfied being slaves of sin. Look at what Ezra confesses in the prayer. For we are slaves, Ezra says. Yet our God has not forsaken us in our slavery, but has extended to us his steadfast love before the kings of Persia to grant us some reviving, to set up the house of our God, to repair its ruins, and to give us protection in Judea and Jerusalem. Now Ezra here is talking about Israel's material slavery, that they are actual su subjects of the Persian Empire. They're not their own independent kingdom anymore. They might be getting to live in their land. They might, access, they might exercise some small amount of autonomy, but they still have to answer to Persia. In fact, that's part of Nehemiah's job there. Uh, it was, it's also part of Zerubbabel's job, uh, that ancestor of Jesus that we read about in Matthew 1. Um, Israel has a governor. Israel doesn't have a king. So Ezra's talking about that material slavery. 
But we find that they are slaves in a worse sense. They are spiritual slaves. Slaves to sin. Along with confession and the plea for forgiveness, repentance includes an effort to turn away from sin. Let us consider the words of the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 6. Go ahead and turn there. Romans chapter 6, I'll begin in verse 12. Let not sin, therefore, reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law but under grace. What then? Are we to sin because we're not under law but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin which leads to death or of obedience which leads to righteousness? But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the true, sorry, to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. And having been set free from sin, having become slaves of righteousness, I'm, I'm speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. But what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. Now that you have been set freed from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so as we repent of our sins, as we confess them and ask forgiveness, as we consider them in prayer... We must remember that we have to make this effort to turn away, to not give ourselves over as slaves to sin. And that's what that temptation to give up is. Right, you look, at, uh, look at Ezra's attitude, by the way, as he's praying about his sin. I want us to say a few words about this. He says, Oh my God, I am ashamed and blush to lift my face to you, oh my God. We'll say a few more words about this in a minute. But there is a sense in which this shame can become part of the temptation to give up. One of the things that the adversary is going to tell you is that you a wretched sinner, somebody who has been forgiven of the same sin over and over again, and now you've turned back to it yet again, loser. How dare you show your face before the holy God? Can you really be so bold as to go again before the holy God of Israel to confess the same sin that you've had to ask forgiveness for 50 bajillion times in the past because you can't get your act together. Right? That's what the adversary is going to tell you to try to get you to not go to the Lord in prayer confessing and repenting of your sin. And once the adversary convinces you to do that, he's got you. If you won't repent of your sin, he's got you. And once he's got you, you are a slave to sin. It's not like you're going to stop committing that sin. 
You're just going to keep racking it up and you'll, you've just stopped repenting of it. You've stopped seeking forgiveness for it. Instead, look at the way that Ezra uses this attitude. Ezra has an appropriate attitude here. Whenever he says, Oh my God, I am ashamed and blush to lift my face to you. Oh my God. What's he doing? This is the opening of his prayer. He's ashamed and he's still praying. He blushes, but he still goes before God asking forgiveness and repenting. We have confidence in the mercy of God and the forgiveness available in Jesus Christ. But Ezra shows us we must never become comfortable with being sinners, let alone proud of being sinners. It's it's one thing to admit that we are broken sinners. It's another thing entirely to wear our brokenness as some kind of a badge. And there's, there's a certain... I wouldn't even be able to identify it with a particular movement or a particular denomination. There, there are some Christians out there that seem to wear their brokenness as a badge. I'm just a hot mess. I'm just a sinner. And if you've ever encountered this, you know the kind of person I'm talking about. Again, not that they, they don't act particularly ashamed of sin. Don't act particularly scrupulous about it. As we welcome the grace of God, we have to remember what Paul says. Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. So instead, let us learn to say of our sins, Oh my God, I am ashamed and blush to lift my face to you, my God. And then... In repentance, to draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Because our God is merciful, but his mercy is aimed at our holiness. He forgives us of our sins so that we may learn to be sanctified, that is, to become more holy. The life of faith is a life of spiritual struggle. And sometimes we will fight the same battles over and over again, and sometimes we'll be on the losing end of those battles over and over again. But the good news of Jesus Christ is that through his sacrifice, we have the victory. And we can keep turning to him. And may we never give up on turning back to God and turning away from our sins. We invite everyone this evening to turn away from sin, to turn to the way of Jesus Christ, to confess him as Lord, and be baptized into his death, burial, and resurrection for the remission of sins and to live faithfully, to engage in this conflict of faith, and to endure until the end. If you need to obey the gospel for the first time, or if you you have any other spiritual need that we can meet for you this evening, we invite you to make your need known by coming forward as together we stand and sing.